You are so important, and I just appreciate you guys all so much. You really are. And this has been a great series. We use this series because it's a great way to cause people from the culture to connect with us as we share the truths of God, because God's in everything. God is in everything, and his truths are always there to be found. But my question to you today is, are our lives in balance? Are our lives in balance? Or do we have unnecessary commitments, useless distractions that are filling and, and pushing in our life? Because if we do, we can easily forget our days are numbered. There's only a limited amount of time that we have. Our days are numbered. So what's going to be your priority? What's going to be the first things in your life? In a culture out of control, how do we connect? So we've been using this series, and we kind of use it to illustrate the message and some of the points throughout today. Uh, you know, so one of the things that I want to talk about is uh, there's this maverick teacher, John Keating, in Dead Poets Society. He finds himself and all the boys in this prep school. It's a very rigid, very hard uh, it just, you know, you just kind of go along, you do exactly what's said. It's that type of environment. And a lot of these boys, have, their families haven't, haven't been with them. Uh, there's hurts, there's pains. There's a lot of things they're working for. And he's using poetry. Poetry to check, connect with teenage boys. I mean, it's like, how do you do that? But in the process, he's helping them to realize there are things that you can overcome. You need to learn to seize the day. You can change things. And he tells them there once used to be a group. It's the secret society of the dead poets. Let's watch. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. You listen real close. You can hear them whisper their legacy to you. You are here. The powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. Who will your verse be? So the question is. How do you stay tough in a culture of compromise? A culture that's always changing, that's doing things different, that's kind of against what God has done. So to kind of look at this and kind of process, I want to ask this. How many have ever heard the phrase, the writing's on the wall? Ever heard the phrase, the writing's Usually what it means is doomsday. It's the end, you know. You're in a relationship. Uh, I kind of think the writing is in a wall. It means that relationship's over. Uh, someone talks about their job. Yeah, I kind of think the writing is in a wall. It means you're about to get fired, you know. It, it means that this is the end. And it usually kind of talks about end times and in what's going on. The writing is on the wall. Historians will confirm that this all came from the story of Daniel. So we're going to look at Daniel chapter 5. Pull out your Bibles as we get ready to do that. And uh, what's going on is I believe that God is kind of saying, you know what? I want you to look at someone else's wall and see what's written on it so you can learn. So you can process. You can determine what your life needs to be, what your story is going to be. To set the stage, we have Balthazar, who is the king. His father, who was Nebuchadnezzar, uh, is been confronted by Daniel. Uh, there was Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, where they, he's also confronted. They threw him in the fire, and he realizes God is God. He says, you know, everyone's going to serve God. Daniel confronted him. He said, you know, you're not, you got your pride. And, and again, it's the second time this has happened. He says, for seven years, you're going to be insane, act like an animal, run around, but God will restore once you repent. So Balthazar has seen this and many more things. Yet, he has taken on pride. And he finds himself, and this is where we pick up the story. He, in this story, he's got a thousand men that are gathered. There's an open bar. Women are the sex toys that are going around. There's drunkenness. 
And he's all very proud, showing all this I have, and I'm in control. We pick it up in verse 2. While Balthazar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. This is God's furniture and stuff. They're a part of his temple. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. There is the party of all parties, the party of the century going on, from stolen items from the temple. And he's going to use them in this party to celebrate his gods. His gods made of wood, silver, and gold. Little G's. He's going to talk about them and say, you know what? God, you are nobody. We have everything we want. We have money. We have sex. We we have control. We have power. We have authority. We don't need you. And this is where we find our culture is today, in this very same place. We have money. We can do whatever we want. Fact is, who needs God? I mean, how important is he? What does he really play? And even in this time, we have taken everything that's sacred to God and we're mocking him with it. Just as Belteshazzar's doing, taking what's sacred and mocking him, we are doing today. When you talk about marriage, that was sacred. That was given by God for, for a purpose. It, it's to explain our relationship with him in a powerful way. There's, there's so much in that that we've just taken for granted. Would you talk about the rainbow? That was God's promise not to send harm, to always be in. It was a promise of, of great strength to us, and we turned it to something else. If you look, all the things that were sacred to God have been turned and mocked back to him. Who are you, God? Then in verse 5, Chapter 5, suddenly they saw fingers of a human hand. So just look at your hand. There's a big old hand that pops up. You know, it's detached, has no body next to it. There's this big hand, and it's writing on the wall. I don't know about you, but that would kind of mess me up a little bit. But, you know, know, just seeing a hand pop up, it's starting to write things on the wall. All right? And he's writing in the plaster of the king's palace near the lampstand to make sure they can see it. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. In fact, if you take the actual Hebrew in this and go back to it, it means he actually peed his pants. I mean, that's what, that's what it means. It says like he was so afraid he lost control. His knees knocked together in fear. His legs gave way beneath him. God is using a very unorthodox way. This is is not normal that you see a hand writing on the wall. This is like, you know, God always comes up with a new way. He says, I want to get your attention. And Keaton, the teacher, he was trying to change things in their lives, uh, the pressures that they face and the things going on. He was using unorthodox ways and standing up on, on tables and, and talking and, and challenging them, uh, those that had poor father figures, those that felt abandoned by their parents and, and all this. He, he's challenging them. And Daniel from the Bible is challenging this culture. He challenged it with how they ate. He challenged it uh, with the idol. He challenged it in every aspect. And again, we find ourselves this kingdom, this culture is lost, doing its own thing in sex and excess and, you know, change and power, and we can do whatever thing again. And once again, the king is calling out all the wise men, come and tell us what the heck this means, what's going on. And again, Daniel gets involved. Daniel chapter 5, verse 8. And when all the king's wise men had come, They couldn't read the writing on the wall or tell them what it means. We have no clue, King. We have, you know, hand, writing on the wall, that's that's weird, but we have no clue as to what this meant. Have you ever felt like God is trying to tell you something, but you can't quite figure it out? Anyone ever been there? Am I the only one that, that 
wrestles with that all the time. God, what, uh, something's, something's up. You're, you're trying to tell me something. Oftentimes, that can be because we've gotten ahead of God. We've made decisions. We haven't asked him, and now we're kind of going back saying, hey, God, will you bless this? Oftentimes, our lives are so crammed with things and whatever that we have no time for God. God's an afterthought. God's not a part of the decision-making. Oftentimes, I find it's, I'm having to reconnect, and then all of a sudden, God says, hey, here's what I've been trying to tell you. This is why you're not getting an answer. This is why it seems like it's like nothing's being happening because you're not, you're not listening. And oftentimes, we can get into that place, especially in a culture like we have today. But when all the kings and wise men couldn't read it, couldn't do anything, uh, a woman reminds the king that there's this guy named Daniel. He, he told your father about a situation, a dream. Uh, maybe he can help you. So in Daniel 22, you are his successor, O Balthazar, and you knew all of this. So Daniel's talking to the king. You have, you've come up. You, you've known all this. You've seen all this. You've seen the hand of God. You've seen the power. You've seen all those things. Knowing all of that, you've let pride get into your, your life, and you've not humbled yourself. You got proud again, thinking that you're the only one, the answer. You knew this. You saw this as you grew up, and yet you didn't change your life. You were aware of what's going on. You watched others fall. Then you did the same thing that they did. That's pride. That's pride. Inside your notes. When you think outside of God, and you think that that's going to work, that's always pride. So in Daniel... The first parts are the stories of what Daniel did and his friends and, and how God used them, though they were kidnapped and thrown into a culture and, and they were tried to make that culture be erased in their life. The last part is prophetic. It's a warning to us today, and many signs are happening. And like a child, a brother and sister in a family, one kind of learns the hard way, one learns the easy way. The hard way is what? You, you got to be hit upside the head with a two before, you know, got to let things go bad. And the other one said, goes, hmm, don't think I'll do that. I can see the results. Ah, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, you, you learn one way or the other. You either walk into the window and break your nose, or you go, I saw that. That hurt. I don't think I want to do that. You're going to learn one way or the other, all right? And that's what's happening here. And he's saying, you're not seeing the signs. You're not doing anything. You're, you're not doing what's, what's right. Didn't you see the writing on the wall? Daniel 24 and 26. So God has sent his hand to write this message. This is the message that he wrote. Now, how many want to know what the message is that he wrote? How many want to know? You, you want to know? Okay, you ready? Many, many, Tekel and Parson. That help you? You have an understanding now? Well, let me get you one. Right. Many, many, tekel and parson. <laughs> you don't understand that? I think, I think this is the way God is with us. He says, you think you don't need me? Many, many, tekel and parson. Yeah, now, what do you think about that? I have no clue what you're saying, God. I have no idea whatsoever. This doesn't make sense. They called in the wise men. They're trying to figure out what the heck does this mean? And only a follower, someone who knows God, can bring the interpretation. And this is what the words mean. Many, many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. That's what Daniel tells him. Many, many means numbered. Write that down. Your days have been numbered. Very simply, clock's been started. And it's going to end. You have this amount of time. 
All the sand in the top, that's it. Once it's gone, it's gone. Your days are numbered. They're numbered. The clock is ticking. We have a birth date. We have a death date. All of us do. Wow, Randy, this is getting intense. <laughs> the point is, you live as it doesn't matter. And the reason you live as it doesn't matter, the challenge is, is that when you have, think you have a lot of something, you waste it. When you think you have a little of something, you manage it wisely. That's the difference. And so often we just kind of waste our time and kind of throw it in there and we don't manage it. Choche. Our boy that lives with us like that, you know, uh, since he's had to start paying for the gas, he manages it wisely. <laughs> there are times that, Dad, I, can I ride in with you? Can, you know, can we use your gas is really what he's saying. You know, it cost me 10 bucks to go to the church and back. I mean, that's a lot of money. <laughs> when you know there's a scarcity of it, you know that you can't go back and get more of it, you manage it wisely. Otherwise, you, you waste it. You don't do anything with it. And the, and the teacher's trying to teach them, you know, we, we're throwing away our decisions. We're throwing away our life. We're, we're just uh, being conformed. We don't understand. What's going on. You need to seize the day. You need to take a hold of this day. You need to get all that you can out of it. And for God, we need to lean into him. We need to grab after him. We need to say, God, more. Corinthians says, all these gifts, but you should pray for more. God, I hunger for you. I want more of you. Lord, this isn't just a song. It's not whether I like the song. God, I want to press in. I want to sense you. I want to feel the glory of God. I want more. More of you. We need to seize God every day. You know there are signs that are happening all around us to shake us? Do you know there are rumblings and roars that are happening around the world that cities are hearing and they can't identify where the sound is coming from? Do you know there's shaking and an increase of earthquakes? There are mass clusters of many earthquakes happening unparalleled in this last month or so? Do you know that prophets have predicted that there would be a new earth? earthquake, there'd be a new shaking and a volcano that hadn't erupted in over 6,000 years erupts in Iceland that very week. God is shaking us and saying, wake up, church. Wake up. He's not saying I'm dooming you and I'm kind of, wake up. You are the answer. You are the ones I'm going to work with. You're the ones I've given authority to. Wake up to all that I have. Don't shallow. Don't lock yourself in. Don't hide yourself away. You are my hands, and my feet, and my extension. You can't ever forget how short, how short life really is. In fact, Moses said in Psalms 90, 12, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Ecclesiastic says it's better to go to a, a house of a funeral than a party. Why? Because there's wisdom there. You think, what's my dash going to be like? I've got a start date and end date, but they're going to talk about the dash, that small little thing. James, the leader of the church in, in chapter 4, 14 says, why? why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. It's gone. And you're making all these plans. Many, many. Your days are numbered. Then tekel. It's been weighed. Daniel 5, 20 10. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed in the balance and you have not 
measured up. It's, it's kind of like this scale. I think what, what God is trying to say is not that you're not doing good enough like that. I just want your life to be weighed towards me. I want your, your thoughts and your order and, and what you put first weighed towards me. I want the scales not just slightly tipping. I want them all the way down towards me. Not finding that you have nothing. You know, we can get out of balance with things that aren't even sinful. Sports can get us out of balance at times. There's nothing wrong with that. Social media. Yeah, pull out your phones right now, and you can find that. It's probably a great source that's kept you out of balance in a lot of ways and in your social media and things that you're doing. You put weight to what's important in your life, and you've been weighed. So here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to pull up your, your screen time on your your Apple phones, or if you have Google, uh, your digital well-being, look that up, test it out, see how you're doing on that. I want you to look at it. I, I did that, and I, I didn't have time to get it to the team to pop it up there for you. I'm using two hours and 38 minutes a day, all right, of my time. So I looked at it. I've got three minutes to Facebook. You see how much I watch that, all right? Uh, I spent 41 minutes watching a message that I thought was really important to me from a pastor. Uh, and the rest of it, I got like three minutes for entertainment, uh, 26 minutes for searching. My lesson prep, I search up a lot of things and correct, you know, check out some sites that I, that I, I favor and stuff like that. And um, the remainder of that time is used for phone calls with you and other people that I'm in contact with. I had a good week this week. Other weeks, it might have been like, oh, Randy used five hours watching Picard, you know, last season. You know, things like that. I, but see, it's easy for us to take things that really aren't important. It's not that we can't enjoy them. I think that's, you know, but the thing is, it comes first. And all of a sudden, we're weighed a whole different direction other than God. And that's the problem. Our time is limited. Are we living God's purpose, purposes? Are you saying, God, here am I, send me. I'm listening to you, I'm hearing you, I want to know what you have to say, you're a part of my day, I'm asking that question, what, you want me to do that? God, send me, I'll do that. Do you wake up in the morning with one of the things that we say that just really builds a disciple and say, God, how do I put a smile on your face? I want to do something today that puts a smile on your face. Do you know you don't have to wait to get to heaven for him to say, well done? He smiles at us right now. And we give him a smile on his face today. He loves his children. But time is limited. So where are you out of balance? I'll ask you another question. Are you hearing God? If you're not hearing God, then, then we need to work on that. If you haven't heard God for a long time, we need to work on that because God is speaking every day. God is a part of everything, every single day. On the back, Daniel 5, 28. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So the singular word for parson is Paris. It means divided. Write that down, divided. According to Bible and every historian, that night the Medes snuck under the wall, through some tunnels, got into the city, and captured the entire city. That night he lost his kingdom. That night it was over for him. Neil, one of the young boys in the movie, is divided about his future and what he's to do and his father's reaction to him and the demands of his father and just the lack of connection that he has with his father. And his father is so mad at him, he says, now I'm going to send you to military school. We'll make a man out of you yet. And a result of all that stress and lack of blessing, he commits suicide and he dies. A life that's not numbered 
that's out of balance is eventually divided. I'm sure there's someone here today that your marriage is on the brink. Things are close. I'm sure that there is someone here that a relationship with a parent or a child is, is just not right and things are going amiss and it's causing all types of stress and problems in your life. There may be business things that you're making or job decisions you're making and it just seems to be out of balance and it's tearing you up inside God is sending warning signs. Just like on your car when the red light starts blinking, it's telling you, you've gone too far. You're in trouble. You need to pull this thing over right now. There's warning signs in our stress and our health. But culture is telling you, don't worry about it. It's normal. That's, that's the way it is, okay? Now, you, you do drink to excess because th that's normal. You, you do use a lot of porn. That's normal. Everyone's doing it. You, you do it. It's stress signs. It shows something is broken inside that needs some fixing, that needs attention. I want you to read the writing right now on your wall. What has God written on your wall? He's telling you, it's out of balance. Got some problems. Boy, the pride. You know, God, uh, w w when I can get things together and I get my life, then I'll kind of give you my life. That's the most prideful thing you could say. Jesus came and died because he knew you couldn't do it. He knew I couldn't do it. He wants to do it through us. Let me give you some warning signs. Are you taking unhealthy risks? You're kind of pushing the barriers in some things, you know? That's why you're, you're going to the porn, or that's why you're flirting with someone of the opposite sex, uh, or you're just kind of doing something. It just You know it's a little bit risky. It's a little bit different, and you're taking some unhealthy risks. Lack of sleep. When you can't sleep, it tells you there's a problem somewhere in your life. The red light is blinking. Some rapid body changes. I'm not talking about normally getting old and, you know, another wrinkle or something like that. I'm talking about you maybe had some sudden gain of weight or you're just lethargic or you just don't care anymore. There's, there's something different. Your energy's down. It's a sign. Inconsistent emotions. You find yourself blowing up, snapping, being irritable. Tolerance is low. I know some of you are looking at each other, you know, stop doing that. Just listen. This is, I'm talking about you. That's a big thing. What about you? Okay? And here's lying on a substance to numb the pain, to bring some sleep to pass some time? Or how about spiritual numbness? It doesn't bother me we're not in church. It doesn't bother me I haven't read the Bible today. There's just a numbness. It's okay. You know, it's, it's not, a, not a big deal. It's just, there's a numbness. There's not a missing. There's not an aching. There's not a desire for things of God of knowing your purpose and living it. You have a purpose. You have a ministry. You need to live it. It's just okay. It's okay. You know, your butt touched the seat. Hey, that's a good week. It's okay. We're not engaging. God wants your attention. Will you let him? question. Will you let him? I'm afraid of what he'll say. He's going to say, I love you first. He's going to say, you're my child second. And then he's going to say, I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you the word of God. Let's reveal some things to you to help you get through this. Because I created you to live beyond pain. I created you to walk in authority, not just be forgiven and exist. 
I have more for you. So much more. Maybe you need to just start engaging again, serving in some area, a growth group, reaching out to somebody. Let God give you a name and say, God, I'm going to start praying and interceding that this person's life is changed. Things like this will start giving you energy and strength in life. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. He didn't say live perfectly. He says be set apart. Say, God, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. And when I mess up, I'm going to come right back to you and say, forgive me and get right back. I'm a, that's living righteously, letting his blood cover me and, and live that life. Order in life comes when we seek God, when we pursue God. So let me give you three quick things of putting God first. The first part of every day, of every day, you just spend some time with God. You know, when you start the day on your phone, catching up on emails, watching the news, any of the things that you could possibly be doing, you're filling yourself that's going to set you off to a bad start. When you start with God, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, just when you start with God, it changes everything. And now all of a sudden, you're thinking about him throughout the day because you started with him. Start your day. First part of every dollar. It's not that I need your money. The church needs your money. God needs your money. You need to learn faith. You need to learn trust. You need to learn that, God, you said that 10% of yours, that's why I bring it to you. And when I honor you, you honor me. If I don't do that, I'm saying, I got this, I'll do it. And the God, the spirit of mammon, is allowed to take from me. It's for us. It's 101 for faith. How do you learn to trust and have faith? It's, it's every week when you're making that challenge. Okay, I'm not thinking about this. I'm trusting you, God. I'm giving to you first. God can't be second place in anything. What about the first part of every decision? There's a big one. How many times do we make a decision and choice about work, about school, where we live? I can go on about, you know, relationships, anything. And we never consult God until halfway through. Something's kind of going wrong. Oh, God, will you bless us now? God would have saved you a lot of problems had you talked to him first. Let him be a part of the decision. Show that you value him. You're not being prideful and self-reliant. You're trusting him because he really loves you. Order determines capacity. When there's good order in my life, it determines the capacity of what I can do. That's what Matthew 6.33 is saying. Put God first. Then all these things added unto you. I want the worship team to come. I want you to realize that when we're out of order and we say, I just don't have enough time, I don't have what it, what it takes, and you try to do what, what, what and you try, you're trying to shove it all, it just, it, you can't do it. But when you say, God, I'm starting my day with you, and my finances, God, if I put you first, you're going to work out the deals, you're going to show me things. God, in my marriage, in my relationship, Lord, with my kids and my decisions, I put that first. And then all the other things that have filled my life, all the other things that have occupied my time, I start letting it, it start to fill my life, be a part of my life. But I have ordered my life because I put what is first First, I've trust in God to take care of that first. When I do that in order, I have a greater capacity. What I didn't have time for before, because it was out of balance, out of order, I now 
can do more. When you put me first, when you seek the kingdom first, then all the other things of your desires and things you want are added unto it. That should be an hallelujah. Hallelujah. I should get excited about it. That's a great truth that you just learned. If I started putting that in my life, what would happen to my life if I did that? Captain, my captain. It's a poem that the boys were taught. It tells of this daring journey on a ship, a perilous journey, one that they thought they were lost at from storms and all the things that they had to overcome. But now they're entering the port. The town can see that they've come back with the needed supplies and the things that are necessary. There's a shout going up. Success has happened. This is great news. But on the deck is the captain, bleeding and dead. It cost his life. Captain, my captain, can you not hear the victory won? Captain, my captain, you have saved us. Captain, my captain, though they celebrate, Jesus is our captain. He is our Lord. And he died on the cross. And there was victory won. There was life transformation given. Your pain, your hurts, your situation, your loneliness, uh, lack of purpose, the things in your life, he died to bring success to you. Forgiveness, yes, but more. Beyond, abundantly more. Captain, my captain. A father, upset that his son has committed suicide, not wanting to realize it's his fault, demands someone to be held accountable. So they force the kids to sign documents saying that Keaton taught them bad ideas and that's the reason he commits suicide and he's fired from the school and he is not only fired from school he is is a letter's gone out against him so he can never teach again he comes back into class grab his stuff the students happen to be there one of the students who refused to sign the document does what he did and climbs up on his chair and climbs up on his desk and says captain My captain. And the other boys begin to stand one at a time and get up on the desk. The headmaster of the school is saying, get down, stop this. One by one, they come up against the culture. Captain, my captain, you have changed our life. You will not be forgotten. It has cost you much. How much more should it be with us that we should stand up in a time like this? That we should stand up where we could be seen. That we should do something different. That we should do something radical. That we should stand out. That we should stand up. Captain, my captain, Lord of all, you are my God. I will serve you. I will follow you. I will let people know. I want us to pray. Bow your heads for a second. If you've never had a relationship with God, if you've had a relationship but you're far from God, If you have a relationship, but you're numb to God. If you have a relationship, but you sure could have more. I want you to pray with me. 
Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you have power, you have authority. I believe that what's going on in our culture is not a surprise to you. You have a plan. You have a date that you're going to turn things around. You're going to cause an awakening. You're going to move in people's hearts. I believe that you're God. I believe that you're in control. I believe that you love me and that you care for me. I believe that you smile on me right now. You don't reject me. God, I admit, I admit there's sin. I admit there's pride. I admit there's arrogance and that I think I can handle it or this isn't such a big deal. Uh, I shouldn't get, get so excited about my captain. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. I press in. And Lord, I surrender to you. You are my Lord. You are my man. Where I've said, I'll, I'll think about it. Where I'll think I said, I'll pray about it. Where I think, where I've said things like this, I put you off and you're trying to grow me. You're trying to develop me. You're trying to make me better. Lord, I surrender. You ask, you speak, I do. I love you. And I express this in my heart, my mind. I'm telling you, God, you're my captain. You're my captain. Will you stand with me? I want you to sing this song. I want you to recognize that God willingly, Jesus willingly came and died for you, covering you with love. Follow me is what it takes, giving away myself to have all of you. God, I'll give you everything. Trading your crown for a cross. I want you to sing you it. Willingly die. Your innocent life paid the cost. I want it to be a prayer. Counting your status is nothing. King of all kings came to serve. You're the king. Washing my feet, covering me. Yet you're serving me. I don't get this. Thank you. 